Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for this special session where we are going to be addressing some of the questions that we've received for you specifically relating to health and wellness in this uh, coronavirus day and age. I'm Monica Reinagel, of course, of the Nutrition Diva podcast, and here with me is Dr. Sanaz Majd. Many of you will remember when uh, Sanaz did the House Call Doc podcast for the Quick and Dirty Tips Network. And Sanaz is here with me today because I've heard, I've gotten so many emails from you and questions on Facebook, and we've also had many of you submitting questions uh, through the Quick and Dirty Tips Network site. And a lot of your questions actually veered a little outside the realm of nutrition and into the world of, of medicine. And I thought it would be really great to have an actual medical professional here to field some of those questions. So Sanaz very graciously agreed to join me here tonight for a special um, a special session where we can both tackle some of these questions that you've sent in for us and we can also tap into Dr. Maj's expertise. So thanks so much for being here, Sanaz. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. And I really miss QDT. So this I'm, is exciting for me. It's great to see you. You may remember um, podcasts that Dr. Maj and I did together um, when she was with the network and we've even done some video together too. So this is yep. a little bit of a reunion for us as well. Yep. So we have collected a bunch of questions um, that have been sent in to us, and we're just going to kick this right off, and we'll read the questions for you and then answer them as best we can. But before, um, before we do that, let me just say that this situation is new for all of us. We, there's so much we don't understand about this virus and, uh, and about how it's transmitted, and the guidelines that are being issued, even from the CDC, are changing sometimes multiple times in a day. Um, and so we are going to do our very best to give you evidence-based answers based on the best of our knowledge, but please understand that even the experts are changing their mind <laughs> multiple times per day, and the situation is evolving rapidly as we learn more, and that there may be guidance coming down the pike at some point in the future that's a little bit different than what we know today. So with that disclaimer, um, Sanaz, why don't you start with your first question? All right, Monica. So our first question is, do I need to wear gloves when picking up food at the grocery store? Can I get sick from touching food or food packaging? And is it safe to order takeout? So um, we're not seeing food as being a major source of transmission for this, uh, for this virus. And so I'm not sure what we really gain by wearing gloves to the grocery store to do our grocery shopping. Remember that the problem isn't so much getting the virus on our hands, it's transferring the virus from our hands to our faces. So even if you were going to be wearing gloves while you're grocery shopping, you still are going to want to be touching as few sur surfaces as possible. You still are going to be one very careful not to touch your face because those gloves are going to be just as effective as transferring that virus from a contaminated surface to your face as your fingers would be. So you still have to do all of that. You're still going to want to keep your distance from other people in the store, spend as little time in the store as possible, shop as infrequently as possible, um, whether or not you wear gloves. And finally, if you are wearing gloves, when you take your gloves off, it's still very, very important that you wash your hands properly afterwards. And now you have created a new piece of potentially contaminated material that has to be disposed of. So you really can protect yourself just as well um, by not touching as few surfaces as possible, um, not touching your face, washing your hands when you get home and after you put away your groceries. Um, and, and having gloves on your hand would not necessarily relieve you of any of those tasks. But I just want to make one more public service announcement, and that is if you do choose to wear gloves or a mask out while you're shopping for your own protection, please do not discard them in the parking lot of that store where, you know, the store employees who are working very, very hard under very difficult conditions to try to keep us fed, then have to pick up your bio trash. <laughs> if, uh, if you don't want to bring it in your car with you, or you don't want to bring it in your home with you, then bring a trash bag and bag your trash up responsibly. Don't throw it in the, in the parking lot of the, of the store. But anything to add to that, Sanaz? I had not heard of that being an issue. I'm just shocked. But yes, I, I ditto all of that. 
Yeah. And in addition, the N95 masks or any masks in general, there's a huge, huge shortage of it in this country. The healthcare workers and the system is really suffering because of that. So please leave the masks alone. Yeah. And, you know, we should also say that um, I'm assuming that that question is for somebody who is healthy and symptom free and has not been exposed right. knowingly to anyone that might have been contaminated. Because if any of those things apply to you, you should not be in a grocery store, even in a full hazmat suit. <laughs> you should be isolated at home. Um, and and if you have if you're have been in known contact with somebody that has been diagnosed with COVID-19, you are also at high risk of transmission. And so um, gloves or gl no gloves, mask or no mask, you do not want to be out in public until you have been isolated for 14 days. So I'm assuming that that question had to do with somebody who is actually feeling okay and not known to have been yes. exposed, whether that increased their protection. That's a great point because if you are sick and you cannot for some reason stay home, like let's say you need to go to the doctor's office, you should be wearing a mask. Yes. Okay, let me uh, cue one up for you, Sanaz. Um, so there, there are whispers going around suggesting that a group of drugs called ACE inhibitors and ARBs, and those are drugs I think that are used for high blood pressure, right? Correct. That, that these may increase the chances of contracting the COVID-19 virus. So the question is, should I consider changing my blood pressure medication? Sanaz? a great question. So the fear is that the COVID-19 virus, like the coronavirus strain that caused SARS, binds to a certain receptor, or you can think of it like a doorway of sorts, called ACE2s on the lung cells of people that are taking these medications. And the theory is that these drugs may actually upregulate, meaning increase the levels of these receptors, and that the virus may then enter the cells and infect us more easily. So people taking these medications are worried uh, rightfully so, that it may make them more susceptible to the COVID-19 infection as a result. But so far, there's no real evidence of this. The American Heart Association and various other expert groups have issued a joint statement to dispel this information since this claim surfaced. And they all strongly recommend that patients should continue treatment with their blood pressure medications because there's no clinical or scientific evidence to suggest that treatment with ACE inhibitors or ARBs should be discontinued right now because of the COVID-19 infection. So this is a great question and the public are rightfully confused, Monica. Yeah, and we don't wanna be discontinuing potentially life-saving medication. Exactly. Without, yeah. Another question for you, because this is one that came in to me and it was somebody who had been prescribed ibuprofen, um, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug for something completely unrelated. She didn't say what, arthritis pain, whatever, but had some sort of chronic pain. Her doctor had been giving her ibuprofen or recommending ibuprofen for that. But then there was this um, stuff coming out of France that ibuprofen might make the symptoms of, of COVID-19 worse. And her question to me was, do I need to stop taking the ibuprofen to keep my lungs healthy in case you know I, I get sick? Can you, can you address that? Yes. Interestingly, this was actually for all stemming from a letter that was sent to a magazine called The Lancet that initiated the rumor. And it was, it, was, it was not based on a research study in the least. I mean, then the rumor seemed to just spiral out of control and took a life of its own. So the suggestion is that the ACE2 receptor is upregulated not only in those people who are taking the ACE inhibitors on the ARBs, but also in those who take the ibuprofen, the naproxen, and all the anti- inflammatories and that the COVID-19 virus again binds to that and uses that receptor to enter to enter our cells more easily as a result. But again, there's no basis of these claims. The FDA and various uh, expert groups have even responded by stating that there's no evidence that taking these groups of drugs play a role right now. And the World Health Organization even responded that they do not recommend against the use of ibuprofen and that there's no scientific evidence behind these claims. So we really must always question and demand evidence when we hear some of these wild claims out there regarding not just this virus, but all medical topics. That's right. In general. Yeah, that's right. All right, Monica. So someone writes, now that I'm home all the time, I find it hard to establish set meal times, and I find myself just snacking throughout the day. How can I tell if I'm actually hungry or just stressed or bored? <laughs> what can I do to stick to a schedule and avoid eating because of nervous energy? 
Yeah, well, chances are probably fairly high that you are feeling some levels of stress or some levels of boredom. And so it's really good that you're tuned into that possibility that the urge to eat may not have to do with hunger, but may just be um, sort of displaced emotions. And But you, your question actually has the key to the answer in that, and that is to, to try to establish some sort of schedule and some sort of plan for your meals, even though you're home all day, you've got access, you know, to everything at every moment, it still makes sense to kind of have a plan for the day and to try to stick to it. I've seen a lot of people talking online about um, how important it is for those who are suddenly working at home. Now, Sanaz and I have been broadcasting from our home st studios long before it was cool, long before all the network mm -hmm. anchors joined us in their home mm -hmm. studios. But uh, but for people who are newly working at home, there's been a lot of advice about how to try to establish a routine, a work schedule, and, and to try to stick with that as a way of creating as much normalcy in the day. And I think the same advice applies to food, um, to, to have set meal times, to have an idea what your meals are going to be for that day, and to try as much as possible to stick to it. But in terms of just how to de determine whether you're actually hungry or whether you're just looking for something to do besides whatever, whatever it is you're supposed to be doing, um, you know, a good rule of thumb for that is whether, you know, you'd be ha just as happy to eat a salad or, or, you know, some tuna or a hard boiled egg as you would be eating some chips or a brownie. Because if you're only hungry for a sweet treat or a snack that, and not really that hungry, if it, if it has to do with um, vegetables or, or meat, that's often a good clue that what you're experiencing is a non hunger related urge to eat. That's great advice. Um, sometimes I tell my patients to consider chewing gum, uh -huh. Sugar, sugarless, but yes, um, if it's just like an oral thing. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, distraction helps too. Yes. You know, and, and also just, you know, having a glass of water or a cup of tea, sometimes just having a little bit more volume in the stomach can, can take the edge off that, um, that urge to eat. And uh, we, we're not joined here by Brock Armstrong, Get Fit Guy, but we'll invoke him in absentia. He would often say, that is a great time. If you know that, okay, I just ate breakfast an hour ago, I'm probably not, you know, truly hungry. I just want to eat. He's like, that's a great time to, to schedule your outdoor exercise or your indoor exercise to, to move your body because it serves as a little bit of a distraction, but exercise also tends to temporarily suppress the appetite or the urge to eat. So that can also be an ideal time to get a little exercise. Sanaz, I have, this listener has heard that we have to be washing our hands for 20 seconds, that this is the sweet spot for how long we need to wash our hands in order for it to be effective. And they're wondering why, why is this the magic number? And that's a really good question. <laughs> it is. Well, unfortunately, there haven't been a lot of studies to determine the optimal length of time for hand washing. But out of the few that we actually do have, they suggest that that sweet spot is somewhere between 15 to 30 seconds, mm -hmm. which should remove most of the harmful germs. Uh -huh. It also really depends on how heavily soil the hands are, though, and what the offending soil really would be. So the dirtier your hands are, you, the longer you may want to wash them. It may be more than 20 seconds. But for most of us with mild soiliness, the recommendation to sing the happy birthday song twice <laughs> should be sufficient, which is about 20 seconds. Great. And I've also heard that it's important to, to actually get some friction, you know, on your, when, when you're washing your hands, that, 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 that actually physically rubbing that part of what you're doing is physically dislodging Correct. The, the, the germs from your hands. So not just like a little light like this, really get in there. Right. And, and rub and scrub. And the same thing is true when you're, when you're washing your produce and you, before you eat it. Now we're not recommending um, that people are using soap or any kind of disinfectant or antiseptic or bleach or anything like that on your food um, that is not shown to provide any benefit. It could actually make you pretty sick. Yes. The um, CDC is still just recommending that we use the same procedures we use to wash our fresh fruits and vegetables as we always have. And that is to wash them under uh, fresh running water. But again, it's that same thing. Use some friction, put a little elbow grease into it because you are physically dislodging 
um, not just germs and bacteria, but also dirt, you know, and even waxes or, or even pesticide residues or anything else that might be on the surface of that fruit and vegetable. Water's all you need, but, but a little bit of, of actual uh, friction also is really helpful. Yes, that's a great point, Monica. All right. Well, seeing as I jumped ahead, let me just go ahead and throw another question at you. Okay. Um, here's one actually that we might both want to tackle. Um, what are the recommendations for hydration related to COVID-19, specifically related to respiratory function? There have been several articles stating that water cons that consuming water every 15 to 30 minutes will greatly reduce lung fibrosis. Can you weigh in? Okay, this I think is one of the, the many myths that is swirling around and without any real evidence to back it up or, or correct me if I'm wrong, um, Sanaz, but you know, clearly being dehydrated is likely to make any symptom worse, no matter you know what. And so we always want to stay well hydrated. Um, that's true if you have the cold, if you have a flu, I'm sure for poor souls that are suffering from COVID-19, dehydration is not making their lives any easier. And if a patient were so ill that they weren't able to take in enough fluids to remain sufficiently hydrated, you know, it's very possible that their healthcare team might start IV hydration in order to keep them adequately hydrated. All of that can be true without meaning that there's any kind of benefit to overhydrating or any kind of magical effect that you would right. get by sipping water every 15 minutes um, to somehow keep the tissues uh, wet. That This just seems to be something that somebody pulled out of their imagination, but it's gotten yeah. a lot of traction, hasn't it? That's amazing. I, I can't believe it. Honestly, again, we have to always question the evidence. Like, where's the evidence coming from? But this is, this is absolutely not correct. Um, I, don't, I mean, so like you were saying, you, you, you want to keep yourself from getting dehydrated when you're sick. That's why when you get the, the cold virus or the flu virus, we always say rest and fluids. Because right. you don't want to get dehydrated because that's the one thing that will land you in the hospital if you're really sick. So when you're, when you're sick, keep fluids down. And if you can't keep it down, then that's a time when you should call your doctor. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, just drink to thirst. There's no evidence that drinking more water is going to help prevent you from getting COVID-19. Wouldn't that be an awesome solution? It'd be yeah. so easy. We'd all be just drinking a lot of water. Would, would that that were true. <laughs> okay. What else we got here? My vision is not as good as it used to be. <laughs> all right, Monica, here we go. I have been trying to shop only every two weeks, but I'm finding it almost impossible. My stores put limits on how many of certain things I can buy. Right. We go, th we go through three to four dozen eggs and about four bunches of bananas every week. Can you help me think of ways to adjust my menu and shopping plan? Yeah. Um, so if you can manage to only be shopping every two weeks, that is terrific. You know, that that's a really good goal to, to shoot for, but it certainly does make that meal planning a little bit more challenging, especially if stores are limiting. For example, if you have a larger family and you, and they're not letting you buy as much milk or, or eggs as you might need to get through that period, or, um, you know, you can't keep things fresh for two whole weeks. So you may have to be a little creative here about, uh, about the kinds of foods that you eat and a little bit flexible. Um, I think we've all had to be kind of flexible about our, our, our meal plans and our go-to items uh, and, and be willing to, to look for alternatives based on availability, based on our ability to get to the store, how long things are lasting. So definitely any time that you can shift towards foods that have a longer shelf life, that's going to be an advantage to you because you're not going to have to take up all your room in your refrigerator or, you, you know, you'll be able to more comfortably bridge that gap, that, that long two week, um, time between shopping, um, between shopping visits. And, and so like with the fresh fruits and vegetables, you know, um, a head of lettuce or some, some berries or something, they may only be good for three or four days, but hard winter squash, cabbage, root vegetables, those are all things that are going to keep much, much longer. You can even keep them in a cool cellar if you don't have enough room in your refrigerator. Um, you can get canned fish or, uh, you know, canned chicken or something to supplement your fresh meat. Uh, if you have room in your freezer, obviously you can be doing some, some frozen meats and frozen 
vegetables. You can use canned beans, canned um, vegetables also to supplement things. But then as you are working through your stores, try to eat with shelf life in mind. So you want to be keeping track of kind of what you have on hand and eat the stuff that's most perishable first and save the stuff with the longer shelf life um, for, for later on in that period. And yeah, and then try to expand your repertoire a little bit. Maybe you don't need to be relying on meat or exclusively as your source of protein. You could be using um, more beans, more legumes, peanut butter, eggs, eggs for dinner. I think we all have to get a little bit more flexible about what our meals look like. Uh, I know we have had some very strange meals in our house because we're kind of cooking out of our pantry and out of our refrigerator. And um, I am somebody who usually shops every two or three days because I kind of like grocery shopping. I know that makes me kind of a freak, but I enjoy it. So I go more often. So for me, only being able to restock every couple of weeks has definitely been challenging and I'm learning as I go. And so don't beat yourself up if you run out of, if things come out a little uneven, you'll learn from that and you'll be able to adjust your quantities and your shopping uh, plans as you go, as you get a little bit more experienced with this. But yeah, the other night we had, you know, shrimp in garlic sauce and collard greens. I mean, nothing that you would ever put together, but that's what we had. And <laughs> you know what? It was just fine. So we can, um, we can accept, you know, some, some weird meals uh, that we might not be putting on Instagram under normal, under normal situations. So be patient with yourself and keep some notes. Um, and you know, on what you seem to be running out of too quickly, you know, you may realize like, gosh, I, I'm actually not buying enough vegetables to get this whole family for this period of time. I need to ramp that up. Um, you know, figure out what you're running out of. One tip I can give you, um, that we've started doing is for things like coffee, or olive oil or things where I don't really have a sense of how fast we go through them. When we open it, I actually write the date with a magic marker on the front of the label. And that way, when we get to the end of that, that gives me a marker is like, ah, okay, it takes us two and a half weeks to go through a bottle of olive oil. Good to know. And that can help you. So we're all going to know a lot more about our actual food consumption patterns when this is all over than we did going in. Mm -hmm. um, I know just not going out for dinner ever anymore has made a big big difference in how we eat. How are you managing it, Sanaz? Well, I was actually wondering if you can just come to my house and do the shopping, shopping and cooking for us. <laughs> <laughs> I hate shopping. My husband does most of the shopping. I mean, it's, it's been hard. I get I me, mean, I have to admit, I mean, we go at least once a week. I wish I could say oh, at least. Twice. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I'm there with you guys. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I think we're on day 18 or so of, of, uh, isolation here. Yeah. And after about day seven, I was like, when do we go out for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. No kidding. All right. It's let been me, hard to give that up. Before we run out of time, because I see we're almost kind of at the end of a half an hour. Let me just make sure that we've gotten, there are no other medical questions that we want to make sure to answer. Um, oh, here is one that I actually wanted to, very much to get the answer to. Is there a test? So we've been hearing so much about testing and, you know, it's, it's been imperfect the way that's all rolled out and now some are available, but is there a test for people who have had the COVID-19 virus and then recovered perhaps because they didn't have testing available, they were sick, but they never knew for sure whether that that's what they had. So is there a test that would show somebody that they had already had it? Uh, in the past, like for an antibody, or is it the same test? What are they testing for? Well, I wish there was, but unfortunately, there is no antibody testing right now for COVID-19 to either test for an acute infection or even immunity. I mean, that will probably come, come as time goes by, someone will develop it, but right now it's not available. Because otherwise, we'd be doing blood tests right now for, instead of doing um, the nasal oh, the pharyngeal swabs. and the oral pharyngeal swabs. Ah. We would just, it would be so much easier to send a patient for a blood test, but we don't have that available right now. So, technically, what are they tests? What are they looking at? It's the antibody. There's two different types. One is IgM, which tells us if the patient has an acute infection. It's a different type of an antibody. And then there's IgGs, which tell us long term immunity. That they had the infection and that, that they've, they've been had exposed it. to it. Correct. So, so like for instance, yes, no, go ahead. For instance, like a, a good example is like when patients come in wanting testing for like hepatitis A, let's say, 
um, we can test for both and we can tell if they've had immunity to it or not, or like things like the MMR, the measles, mumps, rubella. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So we can test the titers, but right now, because this virus is so new, I mean, it's, it's, it's brand new to us. It just came out December of 2019. So really it's just, it's not developed yet. And once they do have that capacity to check for that IgM, that would show, no, IgG, which IgG. is the one that says you had it in the past? IgG. Once they do, do we know how long that would last? Like, would they be able to see that if they have that test next year, would they be able to know whether I had it this year, even if I wasn't sure? No. Well, I mean, it wouldn't timestamp it. It wouldn't tell, let us know when you had it, just uh -huh. that you had it in the past. And the, and the tests that they are doing, how specific is it? They can tell that you are sick with this and not some other acute viral infection? Correct. I mean, that's, this is what the, the holdup has been. We've been waiting for something to test this specific virus. So the tests um, are specific to COVID-19. Okay, good. Well, I, we've, we've run through a lot of questions. We've, we've been um, uh, together here for a half an hour and we will um, be continuing to, if you have follow-up questions for you or things that we didn't answer tonight, you can um, feel free to post those in the comments and Sanaz and I will continue to monitor that, monitor that over time. And if we can add any updates or any additional information, we'll be happy to do that. But we did want to take this opportunity to, uh, to answer some of your most pressing questions in, you know, as timely a way as we could, but mostly we just want to send you our very best wishes, hope that you are staying safe and sane and, yes. <laughs> and well, and, uh, and so glad that despite our um, increasing isolation from one another, that we can still use these platforms to connect with one another, to share not only information, but to also just connection, you know, with, our communities. And so I'm so glad to, to have had this opportunity to, to reunite with you, Sanaz. And thank you so much for coming back to, um, to be with our Quick and Dirty Tips family. Thank you for inviting me. Honestly, it's been a pleasure like always, and I hope to do it again. And for those of you who have not discovered it, um, although Sanaz is no longer doing the House Call Doc podcast, she does have a YouTube channel where she is regularly um, publishing videos on all different kinds of medical topics. So um, you have to go check out the YouTube channel. And, and how do they find that quickly, Sanaz? You just search for Majd MD. So it's M-A-J-D, which is my last name, and then MD. So you could search that in the toolbar on the YouTube page, or you can go to youtube.com slash MD. So if you've been missing House Call Doc as much as we have, you can still oh. find her over on YouTube. So I've missed you guys too. <laughs> okay, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye.